Oh, welcome, everyone. Josh of Severe Weather. I appreciate you joining me on this Friday evening. And for those of you that are regulars, I apologize. It's been a minute. It's been a busy time for me, but we are back and we're going to talk about what's to come heading into the month of May with some possibilities for tropical development before the official start of our upcoming hurricane season. I'm going to talk about what ingredients we look for in May, where things could form, and what the season's still looking like may happen here and some possibilities. Now, it's really too early to go into too much detail on who's going to get hit when and where. That's just not possible, and I don't want to lie to you all about that. But um, I do think it's always great to be prepared before the season starts. The last thing you want is to hurry up and have to do it when a storm is bearing down on you in just a few days. And with the recent rash of storms forming close to land and strengthening before landfall in just a couple of days, that certainly could still be a possibility. So appreciate you joining me here. I'm going to share my screen with you and just kind of walk you through this presentation today. And uh, as always, um, I do welcome you to subscribe to this channel. Uh, so we're going to start off with this season's hurricane forecast. And these are the numbers that I came out with a few weeks ago. And we are expecting this season to, again, be on the active side, kind of similar to last year, although there will be some differences in where the storms may end up tracking and going. Uh, but you can see here that 18 storms are being predicted, uh, half of them likely getting to hurricane intensity, and of those, a little less than half becoming major hurricanes. So that would be just a little bit less than last year. Uh, but I am expecting that five hurricanes will hit the United States and or Puerto Rico uh, during the year this year. Last year, we also had five hurricanes, and that's what think people are going to remember the most. Hurricane Helene, of course, was the most destructive, but Hurricane Milton. Uh, we had Hurricane Barrel, um, which is very destructive in the Caribbean, but destructive in Texas as well. Hurricane Francine and Hurricane Debbie as well. Uh, and sometimes it's not even the ones that get a name that could be a problem. We had a potential cyclone off the Carolina coastline back in the middle of September that caused major flooding in parts of South Carolina and North Carolina. So those impacts are certainly going to be something we have to watch again for this season. And uh, these are the names this year, starting with Andrea going to Barry, Chantal, Dexter, Aaron, Fernand, Gabrielle, Humberto, Imelda, Jerry, Karen, Lorenzo, Melissa, Nestor, Olga, Pablo, Rebecca, Sebastian, Tanya, Van, and Wendy. And in the middle of that list is Karen. And Karen will likely cause a stir because that's what Karens do. Uh, but, you know, we it's still too early to really get to uh, too carried away with what where each storm is going to be at this point. Uh, here's what the tropics look like currently. This is from tropicaltidbits.com, and you'll notice it's been very unsettled in the eastern Caribbean. There's a boundary that is stuck and an upper level low here that is spinning uh, north of Puerto Rico, and this area of moisture is going to be sticking around, uh, wetting those of us in the eastern Caribbean for quite some time here. This is the area we're going to obviously have to keep an eye on. Now, right now, wind shear is very high. Uh, so it's highly unlikely we get anything to develop out of this. But nonetheless, the heavy rain can still cause problems. Uh, you can see the Gulf is quiet. The Western Caribbean and Southwest Atlantic are quiet for the time being. We have a big area of high pressure aloft. That's why it's been so mild and so warm across Florida and the deep south. And we've got a lot of Saharan air and cooler water over the eastern Atlantic, which will keep things at bay for the time being. Uh, now, I want to share with you what current water temperature anomalies are, and the year that I've been watching closely as an analog is 2012. That was the year of Hurricane Sandy. That was the year we had a very hot summer and a derecho across the uh, Midwest and portions of the East. Uh, if you take a look here, you'll see that water temperatures uh, around the uh, Mexican coastline on the Pacific side and across the Southwest Atlantic, we're both a little bit on the cooler than average side, but very warm across the Northern subtropical Atlantic and very warm as well across the Gulf of America, especially the Western Gulf. Uh, you also notice that it was quite cool with respect to average over parts of the South Atlantic and near the African coastline. So I like to look at history and compare it uh, to what we're seeing now. But also, if you look at the uh, hurricane center uh, an or the hurricane analogs, not hurricane center, hurricane analogs from tropical tidbits, you will see that the year at the top of the analog list for the current sea surface temperature anomalies is 2012. What that means is a little more than a month from the beginning of the hurricane season in 2012, the ocean water temperature anomalies, where they were with respect to average, were very similar to where they were in 2012. Also 2011 and 75, 74, and 71. But 2012 is the year that has the highest correlation. In fact, it's quite a bit higher uh, than 2011 and the other years here in the analog. And you can see here the water temperature 
analog here shows what's called a negative PMM, Pacific Meridional Mari <laughs> Range, or uh, yeah, uh, PMM. Uh, let's just call it PMM. I'm having a day, guys. <laughs> <laughs> We're all going to laugh at that. But uh, what you'll notice is that it has cooler than average waters in place across the Pacific, uh, subtropical Pacific, west of the Baja, west of California. It's got warm air in place across the north central Pacific and warmer than average temperatures over the western Gulf of America and near the west east coast of the U.S. and certainly the northern Atlantic. Uh, and this uh, puts us right in line with where 2012 was. Now, the negative PMM often means that colder northerly winds are coming down from the Gulf of Alaska down the west coast of the United States into Mexico. And this will likely continue to bring that cooler water down uh, to the uh, equatorial region and could possibly turn our neutral phase of El Nino or La Nina back to a La Nina at some point here this, this summer. I know people have been talking about there being an El Nino or a neutral, but Seeing it, how cold it's been here off the Pacific, seeing what's happened in the past, that negative PMM, uh, Pacific Marional, Marional Mode. <laughs> Gosh, it's a tongue twister. Try saying it 100 times. Um, certainly can trigger a La Nina at some point. Does it happen this summer, this fall, or beyond? We don't quite know. And, and I'm not going to promise to tell you exactly what I think could happen from that. So if you look at the um, anomaly of storms, you'll see that the northern, especially the central and eastern Gulf and around uh, Florida, typically have seen more than average storm tracks uh, during seasons that started out this way. But in particular, this is what we haven't really seen since 2019 or 2020. Um, we do have increased threats for activity off the East Coast. And in particular, the Carolinas and maybe even up the eastern seaboard uh, into New Jersey, New York, and possibly Atlantic Canada as well. And that's the area I think we need to focus more on this year. I talked about that in my video here a few weeks ago, uh, that the East Coast definitely needs to be on alert because it has been a while. We did have uh, Hurricane Florence in 2018. We had Hurricane Dorian in 2019. And in 2020, we had Hurricane Isaias. Then we kind of got into a lull where the East Coast didn't have anything too significant. Uh, we had We had wet weather for sure. Uh, but right now we're actually in a pretty good drought. Now, I think that could change as we head towards the later summer and fall uh, months here. Here's a look at the uh, temperature anomalies from April of 2012. And here's a look at this April. And you can see the two are very similar. I'm going to kind of bounce back and forth between the two. As we headed into the month of May, we saw significant warming across the upper Midwest and Northeast in 2012. Well, looking at this year's uh, European, you can see still quite warm here over the Rockies. Now, not quite as warm across the Northeast, but take a look at June. You can see the warming is shifting east. And a lot of that has to do with the where the area of high pressure is going to be in place. Now, if the high pressure system like last year uh, is going to be around Mexico and the Western Gulf, that means Florida's got the bigger issues. But when you look at temperatures like this, and you can see how there's going to be some troughing here underneath the ridge, around Florida. This opens up the East Coast eventually later this season uh, for seeing some tropical trouble. Now, I don't know exactly how that's going to play out, but that's something that we're going to have to watch. This is the Oceanic Nino Index, and if you look at it right now, we were in a La Nina uh, as we went through last fall, winter, and the early portion of this year, and now we're in a more neutral phase for the time being. I take that back. That was an El Nino in 2023. Then the La Nina, as you can see here, that set in uh, during the latter part of 2024, La Nina is the blue. Um, you can see right now we are still technically coming out of a La Nina, but more in a neutral phase. Now, if we go back to 2012 and we take a look at what it looked like here, we had a weak El Nino um, in place back at the beginning of the year um, or at the end of the year. But before then, we had a weak La Nina here at the end of 2011, a stronger one uh, towards the winter time. And then a weakening La Nina, but still a bit of a La Nina as we headed into the summer. And then finally, a neutral phase. So 2012, when Hurricane Sandy hit, uh, we were, in fact, in a neutral phase heading towards El Nino. But we went right back to La Nina afterwards. We never truly got into an El Nino like we saw, say, in 2015 or even back in 2023. So that's what we're going to be watching. Um, the current index does have us in this neutral zone between... 0.5 on the positive side and 0.5 on the negative side Celsius of the average. 
Now, uh, the much lower uh, values down here indicated that La Nina. We never really got to El Nino, and now we're kind of hanging around in the neutral phase and may continue to do so into the beginning of summer. Now, as we look at the sea surface temperature anomalies across the main development region of the Atlantic, this has changed from last year. Uh, the ocean water last year was at a record level over the uh, main development region of the Atlantic, and then it cooled with time and continues to cool, and now we're closer to what a typical season may look like. And this would le typically lead us to believe that there will be some storms that certainly form, but maybe not quite so strong peaking in intensity east of the islands. We may see that peak a little bit closer to land. Uh, here's a look at Gulf of America anomalies, and you can see they're still on the warm side, uh, but they were much warmer a couple of weeks ago. Now we're actually trending back towards a slightly more neutral. Um, either way, when the Gulf is warm in the summertime, you don't need to be on the positive side to have hurricanes. Uh, it does help stronger hurricanes. We saw that last summer and fall with Hurricane Helene and Hurricane Milton rapidly intensifying. But this is still in favor of storms forming in the Gulf and some of them getting quite strong. As we look back at 2012, um, the one thing that comes to mind aside from Hurricane Sandy was that it was expected to be a, a fairly quiet year with only 10 named storms by Colorado State and NOAA going 9 to 15, so a little bit less than average, but it ended up having 19 total storms, which was well above average, 10 of those hurricanes, two major hurricanes, and a very destructive season for the East Coast. Uh, here is what those storm tracks look like. We had a lot of what we call fish storms, and I do think we're going to see that again this year where the general track of the storms ends up east of where they were last year. But we did have one storm affect the Gulf Coast. Um, we did have Hurricane Sandy, which got wrapped into this upper level low and then became a super storm as it lost its tropical characteristics upon landfall here in New Jersey. Uh, so we did have activity over the Caribbean, but you could see things were kind of shifted more north and east. And obviously, this is a lot going on for the East Coast compared to your typical season. It's a lot going on for the Bahamas and maybe not quite so much for the Western Gulf. Now, I'm not going to say this year is going to be exactly the same. If you're in Texas and Mexico, you definitely still need to take the season seriously. All it takes is one storm. Uh, but you can see where the clustering of storms is, is typically farther off to the north and east where that warmer ocean water is. Now, looking at the shorter term here, the next few weeks, I like to look at the Madden-Julian oscillation. And right now we are in a phase six heading into a phase seven, but a strengthening Madden-Julian oscillation. This is... Uh, basically a pulse that crosses the equatorial regions of the country. It takes about 60 to 90 days to do so. And it goes through phases where one part of the equator is a lot wetter and more unstable than the other part. Now, right now we're seeing that action shifting so that as we get into May, we're going to see more favorable uh, MJO phases for action up close on the East Coast and in the Gulf. Uh, and we particularly see that when we go into phase eight here, probably after May 15th and maybe closer to Memorial Day weekend. This can certainly change, but uh, the fact is we are coming around full circle here into more favorable phases where we're going to see uh, rising air motion here across the Gulf of America, across the Western Atlantic and the Caribbean, and in particular closer to land. And as we head towards the 20th or so of May, that becomes more common. Here's a look at the upper level uh, convergence and divergence. We have upper level divergence where air spreads, allowing for rising at the surface here. Right now, that is over the Eastern Caribbean where I showed you it was unsettled. We have a lot of sinking air over the Gulf. That's gonna keep things at bay for the next couple of weeks. But as we transition here later into the month of May, you will see that uh, the amount of rising air uh, in place um, does begin to shift back closer to the Bahamas the second and third week of May and then closer to the Eastern Gulf and the East Coast as we get to about the 20th. So for those of you that are planning on taking uh, an early summer vacation for Memorial Day on the East Coast, this is just something we're going to have to keep an eye on for the time being. Uh, but conditions do look like they could overall become more favorable. And then maybe we get a bit of a lull early in June before we see more traditional storms. We also like to look at wind shear. This is zonal winds up at 200 millibars. And uh, the purple indicates areas where... Uh, we have below average wind shear where high pressure aloft is in place. The red indicates areas of higher than average uh, winds aloft, which means more wind shear. So obviously it's not very favorable right now for tropical development. But as we move this along into May, this is the third week of May, uh, we can see that in general, um, we do in fact have uh, much less uh, of a possibility of seeing storms down here get sheared to death. 
Same goes for storms that form near the coast. And the areas I typically like to watch are in the transition zones, kind of in the whites here on both sides of where the ridge of high pressure or the trough will be. And so the northeastern Gulf, the southeast coast, and across the Central and Caribbean and Southwest Atlantic are places we need to be watching. Uh, so that's what we're going to keep an eye on this season here. Um, we're going to have more updates coming up in May. Uh, there will be severe weather as well in the plains spreading into Iowa and eventually into the central United States and even the deep south. As we get into early next week, I do expect to be updating you all on severe weather as we get into early next week. There could be a significant outbreak Monday in Iowa and in surrounding states, possibly Tuesday as well into uh, central parts of the country. But this video is going to focus primarily on what to expect here in the tropics. So I appreciate your time today. Uh, before we go, I do want to leave you with a quick word of encouragement. I'm a Christian. And uh, first and foremost, um, I give all the glory and honor to God because the word of God is living and powerful. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God is living and powerful. The word of God is Jesus Christ. We celebrated his resurrection, not just that he rose, but he is in fact risen. We celebrated that this past Sunday, and he continues to live in us. And he is sharper than any two-edged sword out there that will pierce your heart, that will lead to evil. He can overcome that, and God is good. And that is the good news I wanted to share with you all before we leave this evening. Uh, I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. I do plan to be back on here a lot more frequently. I apologize for the layoff, but as always, if you want to come back, you are more than welcome to do so. If you do not believe what I believe, you are still welcome. You're not here to be judged. I'm just here to encourage you and share the good news that God has commissioned me to share with you. So again, I'll remind you to become a subscriber of this channel and uh, to come back for more. I also have a Facebook page, Josh's Severe Weather, that will have more frequent updates and shares of other pages and other important weather information as that breaks. Hope everybody has a great weekend and I'll see you all soon. God bless you.